Arlecchino releases in the next patch, and we know nothing about her. Okay, that's not entirely true. We know a little bit thanks to the Archon quest, that one fortune-telling quest in Inazuma, and the backstories of Lenny, Lynette, and Fremenay, but all of that basically amounts to she was raised in the house of the hearth and had a confrontation with the previous name, took over the position for herself, and has since improved the conditions at the orphanage, and that's basically it. And that's led to some wild speculation on who she might be for realsies, because surely she's not just a normal person from Fontaine that managed to work her way up to the fourth rank of the Harbingers, right? Well, we might be in luck, because we just got a new in-game book that's all about Conria lore, which I do realize on the surface sounds like it has nothing to do with Arlecchino, but it kinda does. Plus a lot more stuff that we're gonna cover in future videos, because uh, the rabbit holes here are a little deep. But what I'd like to do today is use the contents of this new book, called Perrin Harry, to put together a bit of a speculative analysis of Arlecchino, and also the House of the Hearth before they come out. Now you know the drill, guys. Timestamps, spoiler warning, citations, and links for further reading and watching will be in the description box below. And don't forget to check the pinned comment for any post video notes and corrections, because usually there's some cool stuff in there. But it seems like you guys are ready, and so am I. So without further ado, let's get the show on the road. Let's start by making the easiest connections first. Perrin Harry tells us that a long, long time ago, Conria anticipated the arrival of beings from outer space who could transcend the gods, and they created an orphanage that would take care of them because for some reason, Conria was under the impression that all extraterrestrials would be children. This idea of children of the stars is something I want to make a whole video on, but I'm gonna just leave that hanging for now. But anyway, these beings would have been descenders, and these descenders that they wanted never arrived, so they started taking children from anywhere that needed a place to go. The book doesn't talk much about what goes on in this orphanage, but for some reason it always ends up producing a lot of very powerful knights for the kingdom of Conria, who would likely be swan knights or serpent knights. Perrin Harry was one of these kids. So he wasn't a descender, and it's not actually stated where he came from, but I also don't necessarily think he was an extraterrestrial either. I think he was just a normal orphan. But there's no way to be certain, really. Now, in the book, Perrin Harry states that one of his very first memories was being told to crawl through an ash-filled corridor, one that he suspects is a type of chimney. Now, chimneys are connected to hearths, obviously, and since he passed through this hearth and eventually entered the orphanage, you could easily call that orphanage the House of the Hearth, right? As a quick side note, can I just say that this whole passage thing really annoys me? Because chimneys don't work horizontally, they have to go up eventually. So there has to be some point at which Perrin Harry is either ascending or descending this chimney, depending on where the hearth portion of this system is. Otherwise, it's not really a chimney, you know what I mean? Perrin Harry does mention falling or stumbling a few times, which indicates that he's going down at least a little bit, which might mean that he's ritualistically descending into this new location. The passage itself isn't very clear on this, but if the orphanage was originally intended for descenders, this seems pretty appropriate. That said, I did discover two types of chimneys that are horizontal but on a slight incline that could qualify here. There are chimneys for metallurgy or puddling, and non-mechanized commercial bakeries. Now, puddling factories basically smelted iron ore, something that the mechanized conria would need a lot of, but these kinds of furnaces are frequently associated with alchemy as is the early science around metallurgy. Conria having industrial alchemy facilities is more than believable. I mean, we have the Azocyte factory as a potential example. But the bakery example is far more interesting to me because there's just a bunch of weird little bread metaphors and illusions surrounding Conria. Like how Renee complains that Conria has no respect for their alchemy and that they would exploit it for the sake of creating a bread production pipeline. Then we've got the field tillers. They weren't tractors or anything, but their code name is all about farming or tilling. They're also called cultivators. And one potential theory about Conria's name is that it comes from Cain, who was a farmer. Hence the land of Cain or Cainria. And then during Kaya's story quest, he tells us to find the Arcadian ruins where his grandfather's quote, descender sword is. The thing is, Arcadia was a real place, and in Greek mythology, it was founded by Arcus, who taught the people there how to weave and bake bread. Now, the puddling factory and the bakery chimney lore starts to come together when you realize that alchemists were paranoid about their work being stolen, so they would encrypt it using metaphors, allegories, and symbolism. Some even disguised them as regular recipes and cookbooks. This is something you might be familiar with if you've ever watched Full Metal Alchemist. 
Considering Descenders are heavily associated with the concept of gold and the orphanage was made to house them, you've gotta wonder if at some point this facility tried to make Descenders through alchemy. It doesn't seem like they succeeded, but it could explain why so many orphanage graduates became great knights. Perhaps they had a slight advantage. Now, I made a whole video about the ceremony of the Eucharist and how consuming the sacramental bread in Genshin is akin to eating the flesh of a god, which then grants special abilities, and I don't know if these two concepts are related here, but uh, it really makes you think, doesn't it? Alternatively, this could also be a metaphorical crematorium since those also tend to have underground horizontal chimneys, and cremation in reverse as basically being reborn from ashes. That's a theme we're going to come back to later, so remember it. Now, Piero was from Conria, and he would have most certainly been familiar with the Kingdom Orphanage and its purpose given his noble status as a royal mage, so it's not too unreasonable to assume that he could, upon founding the Fatui, recreate this orphanage system. Would he, though? I don't know. I think it depends on what he knew about the inner workings of the Kingdom Orphanage, of which we know very little about, except many of its alumni went on to become knights. Or soldiers. Now, the House of the Hearth also trains children to be Fatui operatives, or soldiers, so regardless of what really went on back in Conria, it's easy to see how Piero might leverage this initial idea and then proceed to name the House of the Hearth after the Kingdom Orphanage in its hearth ceremony. At least, I'm assuming it's a ceremony. It sure feels like one, because not only do a bunch of adults force this kid, and probably others like him, to crawl through this dark, ash-filled tunnel, but they also block the exit and refuse to let him out until he tells them that he's dead. And when he finally does, they open the door and say, You have traversed the fire of two worlds within the hearth, and here you are reborn. And yeah, that kind of reads like a weird initiation ceremony or something. Now, a lot of people honed in on the whole I'm dead thing, but I think the more interesting word choice here is reborn, because in this game, fire is way more commonly associated with rebirth than it is death. Now, the House of the Hearth kind of does this whole rebirth thing symbolically by giving the kids new names and identities, resulting in a kind of societal rebirth, right? An acceptance into a brand new family. But if you look elsewhere, you'll start to notice this whole pyro rebirth thing is actually a pattern. Like the pyro hypostasis, for example, will try to reignite itself instead of entering a critical health state like all of the other hypostases. It's called an emergency restart stage, and even the Adventurer's Handbook calls this out for being really unique. And in the Travail trailer, the Pyro Nation of Natlin is titled Ode to Resurrection. It's even referred to, again, symbolically in Wanderer's teaser in the fairy tale about burning the ashes until only the purest form, the heart, remains. From which you can rebirth yourself. That was kind of the point of his whole story. But for an even clearer indicator of rebirth over death as a theme with Pyro, take a look at Hu Tao, director of the Wangsheng Funeral Parlor, friend of ghosties, and guide to the afterlife. Did you know that the Wangsheng Funeral Parlor in Chinese actually just straight up means Hall of Rebirth? The name likely comes from a time during the Archon War when plague proliferated Liwei and the Hu family discovered that burning the bodies got rid of the plague and stopped it from spreading, reducing them to ashen butterflies, an event that's outlined in the Staff of Homa, which is named after the Homa ritual, which is one of purification by fire. Now, Arlequino is quite obviously pyro-aligned, given her vision, but we now know that her constellation name is Ignis Purgatorius, which means purifying flame, just like the Staff of Homa. And the thing about Purgatorius is that it's where we get the word purgatory from, and most people think of purgatory as a place you go when you die, but technically, purgatory isn't a place, but a state that the soul enters after death, one wherein sins are cleansed by holy fire in preparation for ascension into heaven. At least it is in Catholicism, which is what I'm rolling with here. But the thing is that the concept of purgatory isn't unique to Abrahamic religions. Hinduism, for example, has a sort of purgatory called Yamaloka, wherein souls are purified in preparation for rebirth, because we've got the whole reincarnation thing over there. And since the Wangshang Funeral Parlor is in Liwe, where you wouldn't necessarily have Catholicism, you'd be more likely to have Buddhism or Hinduism, you can see why we would connect it to rebirth more than uh, being purified for heaven, right? Now, I could see this purgatory reference having one of two relationships with Arlecchino. Either she is the one cleansing things and people through fire to prepare them for the next life, or she is stuck in a state of being perpetually cleansed by fire, which in my head makes her a kind of undead entity because she's not quite ready for rebirth, but she's also not totally alive. She's in that sort of middle ground. You know what I mean? 
Now, when I think of undead creatures in Genshin, I immediately think of Hillitrolls, because we have some detailed records about what the transformation of human to Hillitrol looks like, and it involves necrosis or the blackening of the limbs, something we can confirm thanks to our good friend Caterpillar. Although, Caterpillar isn't technically a normal human turned Hillitrol situation like we have everywhere else, Caterpillar was actually a blend of the minds of multiple people that were placed inside of a Hillitrol's body. But either way, the characteristic is present and Arlecchino's arms are also a near perfect match to it, so let's roll with it. While I have suggested in the past that she might also be a Hillitrol or is undergoing Hillitrolification or is a recovering Hillitrol, I'd like to amend that statement and say that I now think Arlecchino and Hillitrols are in similar states of undeadness, because there's another match for these hand markings. And they belong to Senora, a debatably undead fire witch. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, just take a look at Senora's Crimson Witch form. Notice the markings on her hands and how they're the red version of Arlecchino's hands? Well, that might be because she experienced death once upon a time. See, prior to the Cataclysm, Senora was studying pyromagic as an apprentice at the Sumeru Academia and had, according to the Crimson Witch of Flame set, stumbled upon a long-forgotten art that destroyed her mortal body and caused her to mutate into the Crimson Witch of Flames. The Elegy of the End also says that she swore to use her life's flames to cleanse the world's crookedness, meaning these were meant to be cleansing flames, exactly like Arlecchino's constellation name. Now, according to the Ashen Heart, Piero found Signora before her flames finally extinguished for good and used a cryo delusion to prevent her from disappearing in a puff of smoke because the translation of the witch's heart flames suggests that her real body was already gone and she had just turned herself into some kind of elemental fire spirit thing. To quote, People rumored that she had abandoned her human blood and flesh and what flowed through her body was liquid flowing fire. Senora also has a lot of the same eye motifs on her Crimson Witch form, just like Arlecchino does, and I'm starting to wonder if they're not eyes, but eye spots, like the ones you'd find on the wings of moths or butterflies, since Senora is quite obviously a fiery butterfly, which is also why I'm in the mood to identify her as an undead. Moths and butterflies are heavily associated with the dead in mythology, folklore, and pop culture because they go through a symbolic death in their natural life cycle, melting themselves down inside of a chrysalis and emerging as a completely new life form. This is why they became known as either representations of the souls of the dead, small beings that carried the souls of the dead to the afterlife, or the physical manifestation of a deceased loved one paying a visit to the mortal realm. This is part of the reason why Hu Tao, the director of the funeral parlor, has a butterfly motif as well. She's supposed to be a guide for the deceased into the afterlife like Charon. Ironically, the pyro hypostasis also self-destructs into a bunch of pyro butterflies. And it might be a bit of a stretch, but in my Narts and Kreutz analysis video, I pitched the idea that Arlecchino's throat pin might be based off of a Heliconius melpomene butterfly, or a cinnabar moth. You pair that with the potential eye spots, and we might be in business here with a good connection. That would mean that we have three pyro characters dealing with death and rebirth with butterfly motifs and cleansing flames. What do we do with that information? Let's stop here for a second and go back to Perrin Harry. When Perrin Harry reaches the end of the chimney tunnel, the adults will not let him leave until he declares that he's dead. When he finally does this, an illusion appears in his mind of a red moon hanging in the sky. But it's not just the color that's unusual. When it turns around, it reveals that it's a gigantic, frightened eye. So some kind of living, sentient entity. The Crimson Moon shows up a lot in Genshin's history, and it almost always precedes a disaster. It was present at the fall of Conria, the fall of Remuria, and if La Luna Rosa is a reference to rose-colored moon, then the achievement must suggest that it was present at the fall of Gurabad as well. So I suppose you could call it a harbinger of calamity. Now, the Remuria thing comes from the book The Fall of the Fated Castle, which is a fairly poetic retelling of the Fall of Remuria. The passage that mentions the Crimson Moon reads, The castle's glory faded into the past, swallowed by the glimmering waves. The blood moon the towers once blocked reappeared in the sky, its baleful glow sweeping the land. This passage identifies the blood moon as baleful, which is relevant because Arlecchino's title is Dire Bale Moon. This can either mean threatening evil moon or threatening sorrowful moon moon, or both if you're feeling spicy. Mentioning this because Perrin Harry says that the eye on the red moon he saw looked frightened. Okay, so into that, there's a legend claiming that the sky was once home to three moon sisters, and during a great disaster, two of them died while the third remained locked away in her palace, likely lamenting the loss of her sisters. 
Now, Dane's of Character card says that the eclipse was swallowed by the Crimson Moon, or more accurately from Chinese, the Crimson Moon got its revenge against the eclipse. Now that we know that one of Conria's dynasties was called the Crimson Moon Dynasty, we can assume that the Eclipse Dynasty betrayed the Crimson Moon Dynasty. But what does a betrayal of this magnitude look like? Is it at all possible that the Eclipse Dynasty was responsible for the fall of the Moon Sisters and that the Crimson Moon Dynasty's namesake desired revenge? I think it is. After all, the theme of revenge incorporates the perfect mix of threatening, fear, and sorrow. Baleful. And I know it never says the Crimson Moon is sad in Parent Harry, but the cover of the book is literally a crying eye. Now, this one-eyed red moon might also be a Lovecraftian reference to Groth, a giant reddish moon-like eye made of ash and gas. Also an ancient extraterrestrial god that's wandering the cosmos and singing the music of the spheres. If there are any ancient deities on a planet it gets close to, it wakes up and brings death and destruction. Which is why it also has the name of the Harbinger. Now, I'd write this off as an easter egg, but the problem is that Genshin's got a lot of Lovecraftian references and several of them converge here, like with the Dark Sprites, which are technically Rift Wolves, which are based on the Hounds of Tindalos. But in the interest of time, I'll save the Lovecraft discussion for another video. So okay, all of these little references are kind of cool and all that, but how is Arlecchino linked to the moon beyond these neat little references? Like, she can't really be a moon sister, right? That would be kind of crazy. And I would agree, I do think it's crazy. I think it would be really bizarre for such an extremely powerful deity only to come in at number four in terms of strength in the Fatui, and it would be even weirder for her to have a constellation, even if it's a fake one like Nouvellet's, and weirder still for her to still have a backstory of growing up at the House of the Hearth. So if she's not a moon, what is she then? Well, my first reaction is to just say Arlecchino is a pyro-oceanid, mostly because I compared her to Lyris at one point, and because in Chinese, Lyris's name is Lilith, and Lilith is a figure from Abrahamic mythos associated with children, both loving them and also killing them. And Lyris eventually merged together with the human Marianne in order to save her from death, and in doing so, they were reborn as a new kind of entity, neither human nor oceanid. But then I got to thinking about Senora and how, after her transformation, she was in danger of her flame being completely extinguished if she continued to let it burn since it was literally being powered by her own life. And I wondered then if I could apply that to Arlecchino. See, the former Knave was said to have had a confrontation with Arlecchino, which resulted in Arlecchino replacing her, and that's effectively all we know about the incident. But that incident only occurred roughly 10 years ago, and since then, Arlecchino has already selected a successor in Linny. And Linny knows he's been chosen, but desperately doesn't want his siblings to know. It's almost like he thinks they'll try to stop him from accepting the position. But that means that becoming the Knave has a serious drawback. Like, maybe an early death. So if Senora's flames are powered by her life force and the power of the Knave is similar, then it's possible that the Knave's flame is passed down from person to person, slowly burning away at their life force until there's nothing left. I almost wonder if her hands are representative of candle wicks, showing how much time she has left and how much of her life has been burned away already. But none of this really explains her connection to the Crimson Moon. And frankly, I was a little bit stumped and I wasn't gonna make this video. And then I had a thought. In my Narts and Kreutz analysis video, I likened Arlecchino to Lady Maria from Bloodborne, and Bloodborne has the blood red moon that contains a presence, an alien being from beyond, a great old one, which is also a Lovecraft reference, kind of like the crimson moon Groth there that we talked about earlier. Now, whenever the moon presence descends, the moon turns red. But I bring all of this up because in the true ending of the game, you have to kill the moon presence, and doing so also kills you and forces you to be reborn as the new moon presence, which is far from human, as you can see. So that got me wondering if the moon presence is like a gift or a blessing from the crimson moon that picks a host to carry out its vengeance, kind of like an avatar. If anyone kills its host, it migrates to the new body, forcing them to be reborn as its avatar of judgment, creating some kind of cursed legacy. And I really like this idea, and I was gonna leave the theory here. And then Hoyo dropped a new teaser video for Honkai Star Rail, and a few more things clicked into place for me as I remembered that Arlecchino isn't the only Genshin character associated with the Red Moon. As a quick disclaimer, I am not going to directly connect these two games. The point here is to showcase some repeating themes and narratives found within Hoyo's brand of storytelling, okay? Themes and narratives only. 
This teaser is for Asheron, a character named after a river in hell. She's based on Raiden Mei, a recurring character from basically every Hoyoverse game, including Genshin, where she appears as the Raiden Shogun. Now, Asheron's home planet, Izumo, had a twin, Takamagahara, but the two never really interacted until one day, beings called Kami descended from Takamagahara with the intent to completely destroy Izumo. In order to defend themselves, the people of Izumo forged special blades, each with a very specific dominion in order to push back these kami. Now, the powers of these blades correspond perfectly to beings called Hershers from Honkai Impact III. So think of these Hershers as human-shaped swords with alien powers. Now pay attention, because the second Hersher was also called the Hersher of the Void, which is the same as the second blade forged in Izumo, and both of them share powers. The blade, however, was also said to be able to create a firmament or a barrier in order to keep the Kami out. In Genshin, this is the sustainer of heavenly principles who shares traits with the Hersher of the Void and guards to that's firmament, preventing invaders from beyond from coming in. Again, game stories are not connected, these are just repeating themes I want to emphasize. And I bring this up because Izumo slowly loses the battle against the Kami, which should be likened to the Honkai Beasts of Honkai Impact and the Abyssal Monsters of Genshin Impact, as I think they're all using the same characters, meaning alien. And the only one left standing here at the end is Asheron, who's slowly turning into a demon or an oni, as is the fate of all humans. In the end, she uses her newly forged blade called Knot to attack what seems to be the Eclipse. What's funny about this is that the story of Izumo is very easy to link to Genshin's Legend of the Shattered Halberd books, meaning Genshin is repeating this narrative but with nine blades instead of 14. Now this book is a leeway one, but you know what's kind of funny about this? The spine of the Perrin Harry book is also Liwe art, so there's definitely a weird connection here. Now, The Legend of the Shattered Halbrid also features Fischl as a Sword of Judgment from the Celestial Emperor, and she possesses the body of a girl called Wei Yang, a process that I'm going to say is a little bit similar to what I've been proposing with Arlecchino, yeah? And the concept of a sentient sword capable of possessing and controlling someone is actually present in Kazuha's first story quest, which is all about the Raiden Gokuden, which are swordsmithing schools founded by the Raiden Shogun herself. And given that Shattered Halberd also features King Ermin as a character, this story is implied to take place in Conria. Now, in Honkai Impact, the source of all the beasts and monsters and even the powers of the Hershers themselves is a giant space eye called Finality, and when Finality is embraced by Kiana, her eyes change to match those of the people of Gonria, which makes me wonder if the Crimson Moon is Genshin's equivalent of Finality. Maybe it's responsible for creating sentient blades of judgment and Arlecchino has inherited one of them. And since we know that wills and swords are basically synonymous thanks to the Narts and Kreutz questline, we could say that Arlecchino has two wills inside of her, one that belongs to her and one she inherited from the previous knave who also inherited it from someone and so on and so on all the way back to the first person who received it from the moon directly. And I'm not done yet. Raiden Shogun is supposed to be Genshin's version of Raiden Mei, who is also Asheron. A's normal attacks are called Origin, and Raiden Mei was the Hersher of Origin, alongside Branya as the Hersher of Truth and Kiana as the Hersher of Finality. Asheron wields the Blade of Origin. And in Raiden's Plane of Euthymia, we see, in different instances, either an Eclipse or a Crimson Moon, like the one Arlecchino is linked to. And A also says that Eternity, her ideal, is the closest to the Heavenly Principles, referring at least in part to the Sustainer of Heavenly Principles. And what's even stranger is that A's skill is called Baleful Omen, similar to Arlecchino's Bale Moon, and both seem to connect with the Eye found in the Red Moon from Perrin Harry. And in her boss form, this Bale connection comes from the name of her Baleful Shadow Lord phase instead, like a shadow of the moon. Now, according to the treasured tales of the Choken Shin Kageuchi, also called Raiden Reincarnation, some people are aware of there being two Raiden Shoguns, and they refer to them as Shin and Kage, Light and Dark, Makoto and A. Now, whenever I think of light and shadow, I think of the primordial one, a being of light and its four shadows, three of which were thought to be the Moon Sisters. If you then look at the symbols for Electro, it's made up of three Tomoe, which is kind of weird if A and Makoto were only twins. Like, why is the symbol of a three then? Like, I know it's got some historical context here, but it was used as a family crest. So I ask again, if there were only two in this family, why is it a symbol of three? So here's my crazy idea. 
What if A is also a child of the moon, or the moon itself, having lost her memories, fallen to Earth, and then been hidden by Makoto? We already know that Makoto reforged A's body at least once, according to Raiden Reincarnation, so why couldn't she have done it a second time? After all, A's current body isn't even human-shaped. She's a sentient sword inside of a mechanical Conrian puppet, and she's covered in butterflies! I cannot believe I had to look at underwear for lore. And I could be wrong about this, but I think A, in both her normal and boss forms, is the only character so far in-game to have the glass-shattering effect apart from the all-devouring narwhal. And that is also a Lovecraftian reference to these aliens that come from beyond the beyond. Consider, too, that A drops Tears of the Calamitous God, a title that really belongs to the Crimson Moon given its history, but take a look at this description, notably the last line. The catastrophes go on for too long. Even a baleful gaze must wash itself with tears. We've got a baleful eye again, but also a reference to how it must wash itself with tears eventually, like the Crimson Moon Perrin Harry saw. And speaking of the narwhal, it doesn't have drops to match, but you do get this five-star key item instead, which is called Tears Among the Stars. The description for this thing is too long, so you can read it on your own. But within this thing, we see some themes and narratives of inevitable death through catastrophe and rebirth played out here. Think of A's boss lines, Ruin, follow my blade, or The eye sweeps the land, and Witness the final calamity. Am I really going anywhere with this besides pointing out how weird it is that A and Arlecchino have these overlaps? Not really. But, uh, speaking of eyes floating in the sky full of tears, a solo eye floating in the sky, no matter what it's surrounded by, is usually referred to as the Eye of Providence, and it's a symbol of wisdom or knowledge. Like, you know, forbidden knowledge. I would add an evil laugh here if I had one. Okay, that was a lot of random speculation, and I don't know if any of this will end up being true, but it's, uh, it's kind of the point of a theory, so I guess it's fine. I'd like to wrap things up here, though, so, uh, say hi to all the channel members scrolling by. Hi! Will I do that thing while I try to increase retention by giving you a couple mini theories at the end of the video? Have you ever thought about how weird it is that there are 11 Harbingers, plus Piero, who may or may not be number zero? Well, I had a thought while connecting the sustainer to Arlecchino earlier. Since Susty here is thought to be a shade of the primordial one and also potentially a moon, there should be three others like her for a total of four, and beneath them are the seven Archons, right? So seven plus four is eleven plus the number zero as the primordial one. That correlates to eleven Harbingers, technically. And Nahida said that the top four Harbingers have powers rivaling a god, and frankly, if number six is the child of an Archon, then the top four should be stronger than Archons, meaning they're probably more shade level, right? And then I, uh, I wondered if Piero might be trying to be P-Air-O, like P-O, like primordial one. The top four are his shades, the seven below are his Archons. I mean, he is collecting the Gnosis to burn down the old world and create a new one, so it kind of fits, doesn't it? No idea how this ties into the Tsaritsa. Anyway, as you can see, I basically covered like four different pieces of this two-volume book and ha, managed to make an entire theory out of it, so as you can imagine, there is a lot more to cover that I haven't covered, that other people have already covered, and that I might cover in other videos. But in the meantime, if you want some more Conria deep dives, Arlecchino analyses, or some more information about the Perrin Harry book's contents, I'm gonna link some Reddit posts and YouTube videos by other theorists that I think you'll like. If you made it this far, well, thanks for watching, and channel members, thank you for being awesome enablers. I am off to catch up on making some videos I should have finished weeks ago, so, uh, I'll see you later.